breakfast with Bob. Poncho Man! Thank you! Welcome to Breakfast from Kona. My name is Bob Abbott. We're presented by Active Hashtag Inspired Race. Our sponsors are Timex, Rudy Project, GoPro, MPA Graphics, Lava Magazine, and Babbittville Radio. Our next guests, the true legends of the Ironman, Dave Scott and Mark Allen. 12 Ironman titles between them. Hi, guys. Hello, Bob. Happy 25th anniversary. Are we that old? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's a real stinger, Bob. I know. 25 <laughs> years since Iron War. Mm. Yeah. And you were sort of this close all day long that day. A little bit. I thought I'd bring out my old clothes, too, just to kind of reenact the play. <laughs> nice. That's, well, they, they were a little bit different 25 years ago. but It, it was uh, like you guys color-coordinated that day. I'll wear yellow. You wear green. We'll stay together all day. We'll create a legendary race. No one will ever forget it. The photo the, yeah, the photographers afterwards are like, oh, my God, you guys look so perfect. You didn't have any goo or junk all over your yes. shirts. You guys look clean. And we're, I'm thinking, I wasn't worried about that. I was. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that that's a melt wasn't in my concern mind. either. I, I wish I'd bought the green one <laughs> or, the, or the yellow one. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, but going into that day, did you have a sense that this was going to be one of those races? Because hey, every year we always say it's going to be a classic. It's going to come down to the last half mile, and it never seems to happen. That year it happened. Did you have a sense beforehand that it was going to be that type of day? I had no idea, even in the middle of the race, that it was that kind of a day. You know, I was so focused on just trying to hold it together and stay next to Dave, who set every standard for years in the race and showed yeah. us showed us what was possible. Right. And it was almost like he was so far ahead, so many years kind of out there just going, come on, guys, you know, I need some company. And so in 89, I said, I'm going to stick with that guy. <laughs> I guess you did. Uh, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't think so. I felt throughout the year that, you know, Mark had battled me enough and, and for a variety of reasons, mechanical and, and other issues, which Mark and I have discussed, and he's chatted with the media. Yeah. I felt, felt as though 89... He was going to be on his game, and right. I'd, I'd better be ready. Uh, but as it was unfolding, I kind of felt the same as Mark. You know, here we were together. I was cognizant of Mark uh, being on my on my feet, uh, and I wasn't really aware of anyone else. This is on, in the swim. Right. Uh, you know, I knew I knew it was Mark, and and that's the game. And I liked being in the lead. Mark was right there, and I said, "Okay, here we go." And, th and then the same thing happened on the bike. And uh, I think, Bob, we've chatted before. I was unaware, and not to discredit the other athletes, I didn't know that there were uh, uh, two or three other guys behind Mark because I, ne I never saw them on the bike no. either. And, and did, were you guys concerned about anybody else in the race? I know for you, Mark, you, you came into that race, you had realized that you needed to do longer, longer workouts. We're in New Zealand earlier in the winter doing eight-hour, nine-hour type of training days because Kona's an eight, nine-hour day. So were you, uh, knowing that you had done that type of training, you went to that race just wanting to have your best ever race. Beating Dave would be nice, but you wanted to have your best ever race. Yeah, you know, I'd had six races before that where I finished second a couple times, third, fifth, twice. I could have the lead off the bike. I could have the lead halfway through the marathon, but I could not hold it till the end. And Dave was the guy who kept passing me. And so um, I, I was just going into it thinking, I, I think I'm really ready for my best race, but I still have absolutely no idea if it's going to be enough to beat Dave because he, you know, he was so, he was just light years ahead of everybody. And uh, I, I felt like I was I was closing the gap, but I, I had absolutely no idea if it was going to be enough. Uh, Dave, over over the years, you know, there was something about you in this island. Right? It didn't matter what happened the rest of the year. You came here, and whatever the preconceived notions of what someone could do on this island, if it was like your first time out, the record was 11:20, and you went 9:15 or something like that. You changed everything. You took it. You took the race under 10 hours, under 9 hours, under 8.30, the marathon under 3 hours, under 2.50. Uh, people were intimidated by you at coming into this race. Did, was, that, was that purposeful on your part? Did you want to feel? I mean, did you, there was there's certain, there, we both have seen, we all have seen, that you go into a race, and a lot of times, I'm sure you guys had those races, where you knew you were going to win, and everybody else in the race knew you were going to win. 
And even if you weren't having your best day, people wouldn't go by because it's Dave Scott, it's Mark Allen, it's Scott Molina. Was, was there something that you did in your training where the, that was important to you to intimidate the other guys? Well, I don't know, but the, the training part for me was really to to be at my best form come October. Right. And I always wanted to kind of look at my year thinking that I was the, you know, the, the king the king bee here in right. Kona so I better be ready I was a I was a target and you know I heard all lots of different scenarios oh Dave Scott likes it when it's really windy or really rough or really hot or whatever and I thought well if people are talking about me um, I, I thought good and, and I don't really like it windy and I don't like it extraordinarily hot but I, I seem to survive under those conditions right. so you know that gave me a little bit of psychological power thinking that you know I did have this one little uh, step above the other guys yeah. whether it was self imposed or whether they inflicted it upon themselves but um, you know each year I knew and was aware that every athlete that came here and certainly Mark with his some you know amazing career at, at any distance said he was going to figure this out and being a brilliant runner and having good segments of the run here it was just a matter of putting the puzzle together and and again coming back to your first question i i did feel as though in 89 i was capable of going a lot faster than what i had gone uh in 88 in, right yeah in eight yeah in 1987 or 86, 86. i can't remember the time it was thank you bob 86 <laughs> <laughs> remember, the, remember the times it was but, so long ago well oh, it was long God. ago the record was soft so i i kept thinking that uh, the record was soft yeah. that, you know yes. we could collectively go faster but right. golly i'd sure like to win the darn thing right so i thought if mark was able to to play the game that, uh, it, and even without doing the math, I thought it would be closer to eight hours. I thought, well, we're gonna get closer to eight hours, that's doable, and it wasn't It wasn't the four minute mile, it was just eight hours, it happened to be eight hours, and and uh, that seemed manageable. Well, earlier that you went, you went 801 in Japan, that must make you feel that, okay, that's, that is doable, someone can get close to that eight hour, eight hour banner, barrier. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't totally a mystical number, uh, and in August of 89, went over to Japan and, and did the race, and was thinking about, at the time, my my wife was pregnant with her first son, Ryan, who's 25 now. It just won, right? Yeah, and yeah, and and I did the race and, and wanted to scoot home uh, thinking about the birth, so I went 801, I thought, well, golly, I, I can do that in Kona, that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> For you, Mark, when you're winning everywhere else, right? You win the right. first world championship in Avignon, and you win Nice ten times. You, you've you won everywhere else mm -hmm. except for here, right? And we've talked about it. There was a point after '84, '86, '87, especially '87, when you end up in the hospital, right? You got internal bleeding. That was brutal. That was brutal. And you've got to get to a point where you're going, okay, I'm winning everywhere else. Why do I need this? Why do I really need this win to validate? who I am and, and what I've done. Yeah, and actually by going into 1989, my family, the press, everybody was kind of saying, you know what, this is a guy who's made and built to win this race here in Kona. You're not cut out for it. Go to Nice, go to Australia, go yeah. to the other places where you've proven that you can be a champion and that you can have great races. And, you know, I, I rely on those people that are close to me to, yes. to give me feedback right. for things that I'm unwilling to see. But there was just that one little voice inside that was saying, you know what? Walking the marathon is not your best Ironman, and and I just I just thought I have to go back and see if I can just have my best race. And like you like you said, I I did different things in my training and different things in my just yeah. mental preparation because I knew that what I'd done in the past wasn't cutting it, and so scrap all of that. Let's yeah. see what new things I can put into play. And so coming into the race, I actually did feel like. Um, I was I was a leg up on what I'd brought into this race prior to 1989, and it was interesting reflecting back and thinking about the event. All I can remember is Dave Scott. You know, I mean, there were obviously a couple other people, you a few thousand, yeah, a few thousand other people point, in yeah. the race. <laughs> and uh, actually, at one point, somebody asked me earlier this summer. They said, "Do you know how far back third place was?" Well, gee, third uh, twenty yeah. minutes. Well, and I. Th I had, I had absolutely, yeah, I had absolutely no idea where third place was. It was like Dave and I were completely just enveloped in this thing that was happening because the two of us were having, you know, perhaps two of our best performances ever in, right. in, on the same day at the same time, 
very similar pacing, obviously. And uh, yeah, third place was 22 minutes behind you, 23 minutes behind mm -hmm. uh, behind me. Yeah. And uh, it's culture. like we were in a we were just in this other thing that was going on. But r reflecting back on 25 years, I, I think it's taken almost 25 years for for me personally to kind of get a grasp of what it w is that we did out there. You know, because in the t at the time that we did it, of course, you know, we broke the record. We had this amazing battle, but is this a commonplace thing or not? And 25 years later, I can see that that was a that was a pretty special day that was kind of a gift for both of us. Well, and I'm sure both of you were thinking, all right, we had this great battle in '89, '90, we're going to come back and we're going to go at it again, <laughs> right? You know, and then and unfortunately, it never happened again. Uh, mm -hmm. When when you uh, took a year off in '94, Dave came back and had a great race, uh, but but you weren't in the field, so right. we never got to see that again. Which probably means made this mean even more the fact that you guys never did battle again. Yeah, I, th I thought we'd come back, and yeah. you know, circumstances and, and history just didn't allow it. Didn't I work, guess yeah. it didn't work. So. Uh, I mean, it's interesting just being here 25 years now since that race, and and Mark and I have been together out on the race course. And we got Lee. Look at the conditions this year. You know, oh, our, our times are going to be shattered. <laughs> we're we're kind of quietly going. Gee, I hope that doesn't really happen. You know, if there aren't 14 guys going into that time in '89, you know, yeah. like to yeah. hang on to that for a little bit longer. And you know, ironically, it's um, you know, in, in the course of time, that those race that race that we did our times have held up pretty well really well you know 809 and 810 i mean you don't see people going that fast on a regular basis. i mean crowley went 803 a couple years ago but usually it's between 810 and 820 someone's winning the race why do you think that people aren't going aren't going faster i mean would you think when you ran 240 and 241 that that was 89 that with all the technology on the bike and all the rest of it that people be getting off the bike fresher and running 235 236 mm. Less oxygen, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Global warming. Global I don't know. warming is a problem. Bring it on. The vlog. I, I, I think part of it is that, you know, when Dave and I raced, we were expected to be world-class at Olympic distance, half Ironman, full Ironman distance mm. racing. And so, you know, throughout the season, we had all of those kind of different physiologies developed to be competitive at all, all three distances. Nowadays, you will see Ironman distance folks doing Olympic distance races, but they don't have the same focus that we did. And so I think maybe we just had a broader, um, a broader base of physiology that had been developed. And again, you know, it was this rare moment that happened because the two of us had this incredible day together. Yes. I mean, it's also interesting on the bike, Bob. I think a lot of the guys, particularly when you see that big wave that seems to gather in every race, you know, since ours, and there's 15 to 18 guys right. in this long peloton, and a lot of them are accelerating and backing off. And I'm, without using the name, I'll never forget it. We were in, in the van. I think we were in the van at the same time. He said, oh, this is 50 watts lower than what I normally ride. And I kept, kept thinking, well, why don't you ramp it up 50 watts and drop those guys because you can't run. <laughs> and, 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 and I think what's, what's happening is that there's a lot of guys that, that accelerate way up into their, their, their VO2 range, which right. is very, very hard. And then they back off and they accelerate again. So they're burning glycogen. This is my theory. Yeah, yeah. They're burning glycogen, you know, at a ferocious rate, and they're not staying on their on their race plan. So they're he, letting other people dictate. Uh, yeah, and, and and I've mentioned this to to Crowey and some of the other athletes and Neko. I said, be up in that top three. Don't allow those la those large oscillations right. in effort. And then you know you've got the game to run without being depleted on the bike. Whether that's the case or not, the the running times have not. Um, correlated to the run talent, and right. and with the ITU guys that are coming up yeah, with Fredano, Fredano and Dockery and, and all these guys, yeah, they're fast. They're yes. real fast. And, and you know, I kept thinking, gee, uh, just for the records, we didn't have chips. Mark's run time way back in '89 was actually 238 high. Oh, and that's 239 right. Because they included and transition. 241. Right. So, but I, I would think with the talent and the running ability, what you see in the halves, where guys are running 108 or 109 on a legitimate course, that, that's pretty darn fast. Right. Why aren't they running 231 or 232 here? And they're way off that. I mean, last year's run times for the men were shockingly slow. And I think, and I'm not discrediting the field, it's just what they did is what they did. 
and uh, I think it's just going to take maybe a couple guys to all of a sudden eclipse that 240, and then the rest of the party is going well, to join them. Similar to what happened when you went under, you know, when you went under three, all of a sudden people start running under three. It, it takes somebody to sort of lead the way. Someone has to go sub 240. Well, let's just say it's kind of stagnated for 25 years. I know, I know. I've, I've, I've been looking at it. Mm. So let's go through the, the the last the last 10k of that of your race. Ah, but so aren't we over? Oh, that, ah, that was such yeah. a great period. <laughs> okay, let's cut it off. Best now. miles let's, in Ironman yeah. history. <laughs> What's the point of talking about that? Why don't we talk about the sea life behind us here? <laughs> that's, that's silly. That's been rehashed oh, over and over yeah, again. I, knew that I thought your show was popular, Bob. Oh, he's hurting my feelings. <laughs> So let's talk about Rachel Joyce. And no, we can, we, can, we can talk about oh, this. It's, no, your, it's really okay. your show. Oh, <laughs> yeah. God. It's old news. You ran a slow 10K anyways. Mark won. So let's pick the other. No, I don't, I, don't, I, don't mind talking about, I don't mind talking about it. I've let it go after 25 years. It, it bothered me for a couple of weeks, but now 25 years later, I've let it go. Have you let it go? Yeah, so we can talk about that. Okay. Mark wants to talk about it. Okay. I know. Yeah, yeah okay. We'll I love that last 10K. It's, it's a good oh, that was my story, favorite actually. 10K, yes. <laughs> Go, Go ahead, ahead Mark. Yeah. First up. Well, first of the blocks. Okay, first of the blocks. Uh, my, my, my tactic going in yes. was if I had the engine at the end, and I was confident at the end that uh, my unsightly form would work on the backside of Polani Hill on yes. the downhill, and I, and I really wanted to run quickly on that backside of the hill and carry it all the way down to Lee Drive, which is about a 1.4 miles when you're at the top. I yes. knew exactly, and I thought it's a long enough runway with a long descent, a hard pounding descent, that if, if I could make my move th at that point, I could get away from Mark. Yeah. And that was really my tactic. And as the race unfolded and we were together, uh, I had dropped back at an aid station, had come all the way up. This was between mile 23 and 24, and I'm looking at the backside of Polani Hill. And, and everyone who's run this course knows that, you know, when you're riding your bike up, the, up that hill, it doesn't seem like anything, but at that point in the race, it becomes significant. Yes. And that little gradient, yeah, it, just, it, it goes up right away. And, and as I got next to Mark, I, I actually remember telling myself, you know, just relax. At the top, you're going to take off. And I had about five seconds to tell myself to relax and, uh-oh. He's gone. Uh, Mark is doing something else, so you better respond. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we, were, we had been together, and, and there were a lot of, a lot of uh, points out on the marathon where Dave was really pushing it, and I didn't know if I could hang on. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things happened for me personally out there, and finally... Um, it became apparent that the move w was going to take place on that hill, either going up or on the other side going down. And I had seen that uh, as we were coming up to just the, the, the lesser upgrades, that it seemed like Dave was getting a, just a little bit weaker. On the downgrades, he was definitely stronger than me. And uh, so I thought, okay, there's one last big up and one last big down. If I wait until the top of that hill, he's got it. He will have it. And so at the bottom of that hill, something just said go. And I took off. And I, I knew that I, I, it had to be more than a few feet because, you know, from basically from hour six till the end of that race, that's Dave's territory. Yeah. You know, if you were even in the same zip code, he knew he, he had you. And uh, so I, I just sprinted up the backside of the hills as best as I could and then just prayed all the way down the other side that I didn't cramp or stumble or fall apart or whatever. And I got to the bottom and, and looked back and, and I, I couldn't see him. And at that point, I just felt like, yeah, I, really, I, ha I think I have it, you know. So when you look at the fact that you, know, you had all those attempts in Kona, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a 12-minute lead guy runs you down in 84, 80, 86 was, you know, you were coming off a of Nice and, and Dave wins again, 87, you have a five minute lead or so. 88, when Dave pulled out the night before with his knee, um, everybody thought, oh, Mark's for sure gonna win. And then you flatted a number of times and Scott Molina wins. But coming back in 89 and having all those horrific experiences and finally winning, but not, not just winning, but having Dave there, and the fact that it was the greatest race you ever had there in Kona, going 8-10. How important was that to, to win and not win in 88 when you would have, you know, when Dave wouldn't have been there. But to win when the best guy ever, right at that point, best guy ever had the greatest day of his life and you ended up in front of him. 
I couldn't have scripted it better, you know. Yeah. Um, Dave could have. <laughs> yeah, Dave probably would have liked to, to have a little bit tweaking in the manuscript, but just a wee bit more. Y you know, it. On it, my side. There, there were a lot of the years after the race where I was kind of cynical, thinking, "Well, why didn't I win this year?" And even uh, there were points after '89, I thought, "Why did it take so long?" But you know, if I f reflect back, clearly, you know, it was to set up this 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 amazing battle. And had I won in '88, I don't think I would have beat Dave in '89 because I would have come in as you know, the defending champ against the guy who's won it six times, and I would have had a very different strategy than I would have had as I, as I did in 89, which was to just, hey, he's the best, he knows how to pace it, stick with him, and then see how it, how it plays out. And uh, yeah, it was um, a day like, uh, I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever see another day like that with two, two people. Yeah. At the top of their game, two guys at the very top of their game, wanting the same thing yeah. and being together all day long. It was, you know, it was, a, it was an epic day. And with the, with the history that we had over so many races all over this globe. Yeah. Do you guys yeah. have any idea how many times you raced each other? Six. No, no, not just. <laughs> no, no, not just here. I mean, all over the world. Yeah. Probably. I, I don't know. It's funny. We, we we raced a number of times early on, and and Mark was amazing, and also you know got, obviously dominated in Nice. And, right. And one year I was in the lead and got a flat tire, and I thought, oh boy, here here's my chance, and that didn't happen. Uh, and then Australia in '89, uh, we went over, and Mark had a brilliant race that year, and I was I was in in pretty good shape. That was April, I think, Mark. Yeah. And um, it was a 120k bike and a 30k yep. run, a long, a long day, not as long as Hawaii. And and uh, you know, I, I just felt when Mark passed me on the run that I've got to up the ante for Kona, <laughs> and he's going to be ready. And it, it, ironically, someone came up to me last year and said, "Do you guys do you know what you ran in those times?" And I'm not a historian like you are. And this guy, I said, "I have no idea." And he goes, "Well, Mark ran." 138 or something for a 30k, which was, I, I think, one of the most phenomenal run times ever. Yeah. It's like 520 per mile. Yeah. So, uh, incredible. And I was a couple of minutes. I know that's what I said. Uh, I, said Gee, <laughs> I ran the other. I ran the other day, and they had a little the little speedometer thing for the cars. Five, six. <laughs> I, I did the math. That's a 10 minute mile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Likewise. Boys, thank you so much for, for coming in. It's, uh, it's I know uh, it's 25 years ago, but and it's it's hard to talk about something that's uh, 25 years old. But man, it's it's really it's it's an important moment in Ironman history. And, and you guys, you, you, there's so many people who are motivated to get into the sport from watching that race. Right? Mm -hmm. It was a race. It was one of the first times where you were even there was close races before, but it was never two guys side by side all day long. It, it changed the sport, I think, forever. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Bob. Right. Pleasure. A pleasure. Poncho Man. Yeah, Come Poncho on man. in, baby. Thanks. I am the tiger. It's breakfast with Bob. Poncho Man. Thanks again, everybody, yeah. for tuning in. Breakfast from Kona. Presented by Active, Inspired to Race, and sponsored by Timex, Rudy Project, GoPro, MPA Graphics, Lava Magazine, and, of course, Babbittville Radio. Big thanks to our two legends, Mark Allen, Dave Scott. Another round of applause from our huge studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you guys. <laughs> wow, you came and drove.